Hey guys, welcome to another episode of Matt Chats. I am here today with Russell Worth from Showpad. Uh, super excited. I have had the opportunity, I was put into him with a sales rep from Showpad. So it's great to see this, you know, whole thing come to fruition. Meeting with Russell the very first time, I could not believe where he came from and his background. And I'm excited to bring him on today to talk about where all he's been, how he ended up in enablement, and then how does he continue that success from what he's had in his past into driving and bridging that gap uh, with his enablement partners and teams today. So Russell, welcome. How's Thank it you. going today? I'm doing great. And I got to ask, was, was the part of my background that was most surprising that I was from Iowa, just about an, uh, an hour north of where you're at? You know, I wouldn't say that's surprising. It was probably like, I don't want to put a downfall mark on that, but <laughs> that, the best thing about, I will say uh, with Russell, him and I have always joked, obviously, if you know anything about football, Nebraska and Iowa are the biggest rivals um, to each other. And yeah, we, Russell and I have definitely been uh, hunting that one out. But we do share a mutual love of our famous uh, runs of sandwich. And I think we can call that kosher at that point. <laughs> A bit. I don't mind runs of it, I'll take a maid right any day. And for those that are in the, you know, the consider us flyover states, yeah, there, there are these kinds of things you fight over in the Midwest because it's just that much fun. Yeah, we're, we're neighbors, but there's always a friendly rivalry, not just football, but food items. <laughs> that is very true. I love it. Uh, Russell, start out, tell us a little bit about your background, how you got to be VP of enablement at Showpad and kind of just how you journeyed the whole way up to the top. Yeah, you know, after I get to know people, I, I commonly tell them I'm an engineer with a personality, you know, because my background is chemical engineering and petroleum refining, you know, and, but I, I pivoted, you know, I spent a lot of time, you know, in semiconductors and oil and gas companies, but then pivoted into software development, you know, using software to solve problems. And I always thought, you know, you build the best software, it's going to win, you know, you're going to get people that are, are going to want to buy. And I didn't realize how hard sales and marketing was until I had to do it. You know, I would always spend my time coding things, you know, working for a lot of large telecommunications companies. But when I work for a startup as the first employee and I start going to do the shows and we think we have just the best thing ever. And I'm, I'm there as the engineer, you know, ready to demo the product and realizing, gosh, sales and marketing is really, really hard. And so I started to get gravitating towards, that, you know, thinking, OK, product marketing, we're just not describing the product well enough. We're not putting it on the website well enough. And then more and more I got to it, you know, I realized, yeah, customers are just inundated with things, you know, buzzwords and features and websites that talk about their products and solutions. Yet one of my favorite things is I ask salespeople, is it fair to say the most common question is, yeah, I went to your website, but I still have no idea what you do. And that's the thing. I think a lot of times, you know, marketing tries to use this amplifi amplified voice and it's really tough to try to get some attention and interest in their products and solutions and brand. But for salespeople, that's where you really got to get involved and have that discussion. I mean, Matt, it wasn't until we met and I kind of did a little sales routine on you, some discovery questions. Oh, you're from Omaha. What's your favorite sandwich? Do you have the big red N on your helmet for Nebraska? You know, you got to have these quips to be able to discover some people, build trust, and then you can have a dialogue. And that's really where action happens. That's why I like sales nailing. You get your product and features, you get your uh, sales rep to understand it, but then techniques to build that trust and then really understand the customer and some of their challenges and where you might have a fit for your solution. Yeah, I think you hit that spot on. And I love that you focus so much on discovery. Like that to me is the number one part of the sales process. And I think even having that discovery background actually helps a lot of the buy-in when you're trying to do your projects from enablement perspective with your VPs and uh, directors of different departments and stuff like that. So totally 100% agree, especially on that discovery part. That, that's huge. And yeah, I was shocked because honestly, Russell, you're the first person that's like called out that stuff as soon as you start talking. So I loved it instantly. But, it was a great connection. Well, I got to know my audience, you know, and I could I could hang with people from Boston, talk about you know the clam chowder. I've been to Wrigley or uh, I'm sorry, I'm just, that's just in my mind because we're in Chicago, but uh, certainly <laughs> Fenway. I've had the Fenway Franks, you know, I, I know all about that tradition. So you, you just got to make sure you have some of those experiences in life that you can try to relate to a lot of different people. And you know, back to how I got into sales, I remember you know when we were had this great product, working for a startup. And I was given the most popular worst sales book of all time. Everybody talks about great sales books, but this guy came in, gave us some Miller Hyman training. He actually bought a great book called Green Eggs and Ham. And he said, everybody buys this as a sales book, you know, because, hey, Matt, I got some green eggs and ham. Would you like it here? Would you like it anywhere? It's not really discovery. He's got a product that he's pushing. He's not actually saying, what time of day is there? Are you even hungry for breakfast? could be dinner. That's why the guy didn't want it. So you just got to come back when the timing's right. So doing proper discovery, so you're not doing green eggs and ham selling, is going to be very, very important. You may have a great product, 
You can talk about it over and over again to try to get that earworm into people's minds, but until you do some, some good discovery and understand about them and their situation, you're really not going to sell. Right. No, that, that's, uh, that's totally spot on. I love that. And I love that you use Green Eggs and Ham because I actually was given that book at one point for my sales career too. So that's great. No, it is. Uh, I used to have it here on my shelf. My five-year-old took it. So now we read it every other night. <laughs> I love this. So obviously today we're talking about bridging the gap. You've got an extensive background. You've worked with various amounts of people uh, from different aspects of life too and different aspects in the market. Um, talk about how you best in your role with enablement work with outside stakeholders. So for outside stakeholders, I'm presuming you mean just other departments, marketing yeah. and product and the like, right? Yeah. yeah, so a lot of that is, you know, just understanding, okay, what are my goals in sales and enablement? You know, very simply, we always say it's help sales sell more faster. You know, you see more and more discussion about sales and enablement being an orchestrator. You know, because there's so much going on in the modern sales life. You know, it isn't just here's your data sheets and, and the like, go hit the road and take some people out to dinner and try to get them to buy. You really got to have a lot of activity. You know, there's a lot of what I call, you know, the selling aspect that you think customer facing and the non-selling aspect, which is all your operational facing things. So I try to keep a mind on both, which is kind of tough. You know, anytime you talk about back office operations with legal contracts, MSAs, the paper process, uh, even in sales ops, looking at some of your numbers and your CRM. You really got to understand how is the business measuring and helping sales from the non-selling aspect. And then also look at that selling aspect is be really putting out in the market to whom, you know, what kind of things need to be tweaked and adjusted for marketing. You know, marketing, they build these fantastic content production systems that are really tuned for broad-based marketing. You know, there are snackable nuggets that are on the website, infographics that we've got to say, okay, what does that really mean? You know, you're, you're telling me you're selling me a platform, but what does that mean to an end buyer and solving business problems? So I'm always asking a lot of questions. I'm trying to put on the role of a seller trying to sell this, but also a customer trying to buy it. And does it make sense? And if it doesn't, just gently call that out and coach people and help them build better content, better training, better description of where to go and what to do. Because more often than not, sales just need just-in-time education. You can teach them all this stuff. But the worst thing you can do is bring them in, give them four weeks of boot camp to try to memorize everything. In my approach, the best thing to do is make them aware of all these different things and say, look, those rare times you need a legal contract or something in InfoSec, here's what it is, where to go, how to find it, how to use it. You know, just very small Twitter sized, 140 characters or less. Yeah, no, and I love that. And, you know, one of the things that you and I talked about, I'm going to throw you for a little bit of a loop, but you and I talked about yes. this the first time and I loved it. And I do think that this is a huge part. And I think you've been the only one that actually is like, describe this to me, but you talked about talking to everybody and making sure you're communicating effectively. You brought up something that I want you to elaborate on, and that was the Rosetta Stone. Can you talk about that a little bit more? Yeah, I actually brought it. I've got my little souvenir Rosetta Stone here today. You know, and, and a lot of people don't know this, but the Rosetta Stone, the actual Rosetta Stone isn't software. It's the stone that was actually written by the Greek Emperor Ptolemy back in the 1400s, or 400s, I should say. And it's a proclamation on it. And, you know, something about trade disputes and land disputes. I, I, can't, I can't recall exactly off the top of my mind right now, but the net is it helped us understand different languages. It was the, the, the biggest piece of archaeological find that had Egyptian hieroglyphic, Egyptian demonic, and Greek, the, uh, the language that, that we all have a root in with, you know, English, French, uh, and all these other languages, but it helped people understand all these different languages. So I have this on my desk as a reminder that I can speak sales, I can speak engineering, I can speak marketing. I got to make sure I know just enough to be able to translate because that's really what we're dealing with is a lot of different departments that they speak different languages, but they're all trying to do the same thing at the end of the day. And the Rosetta Stone is just that reminder. It's just this proclamation that was made, different languages. What we, we've all we've just got to be able to understand and do a little bit of translation. Yeah, no, I... And I love that. I, uh, when we were talking with Davey last week, we talked about enablement being that translator between multiple different roles, especially from his marketing role to sales. Like we're the ones that can transcribe that message back and forth. So I, as soon as I, was, I saw you this week too, I was like, yes, I remember we talked about this. We got to hammer that one out. I loved it. Um, all right. So shifting gears, we talked about how we work with enablement and outside stakeholders. Now talk about like that gold medal moment for you, the moment that you shouted from the rooftop and said, this is exactly why I am what I am. And this is why I'm in enablement. And this was why I worked with my outside stakeholders so well. 
Yeah, you know, I'll talk about one I'm most proud of, and it was working with the vice president of sales at my prior company, Optiv. And Optiv, we resold information security products. So you had, you know, HP and Symantec and all these other solutions that we had to represent in the market. And we built a great platform. We had to make sure our sales reps knew just enough about everything. They didn't have to be masters of everything, but just know just enough about everything that after some discovery, you can take the customer to the right solution that they need. And so one of my VPs in sales was at a meeting with a partner. It was, I don't mind naming it now, Semantic. They just got acquired. So uh, a lot of these people moved on, but he's at this meeting and all these execs are there. And he's saying, and look, here's how I can represent your products. And I remember it was very funny. The Semantic uh, VP of sales turned to the VP of marketing and said, wait a second, how does this guy have our latest deck and our latest messaging? And I don't even have that. So my proudest moment was the fact that we were able to move at just digital 21st century speed. And so I've always joked, you know, with people that they come in and they always try to enable sales and they come in with their binders and everything. I said, oh, that's great. Can you fax me? Can you fax me those uh, data sheets as well? And I said, well, what's your fax number? And I said, well, I live in the 21st century. I don't have a fax number. We shouldn't be dealing with paper products either. Let's try to digitize some of these things in terms of getting information to the sales team and structuring the right way. So just the fact that I was able to do that for my VP of sales and make him look really, really good. I was actually able to get a couple big, big opportunities out of that because he built trust. He showed that he knew the markets, that products, and how to position and sell it better than anybody that worked for the company. Yeah, no, that, that's huge. That, that's great. Looking at our notes too, I know you mentioned something about SKO. It's a hot topic right now. I won't jump into that today, but I do want to let people know that, especially when it comes to kickoff, Russ has had some good success. He did a kickoff with a major acquisition within 30 days with a company-wide SKO. So if you want SKO help, Obviously, I've done mine already from this year, so talk to me about that. But also reach out to Russell. He's got good insights as well, too, that he could probably provide for anybody. So I'll make that plug for, for you, Russ, uh, and, and toss that out your way, too. <laughs> no, that, that's quite all right. We've actually, uh, you know, uh, not to plug my company, we, we actually had a lot of customers come to us, you know, trying to solve for that challenge because you can't get on site anymore. And yeah. you've got to try to get similar engagement, but we all have Zoom fatigue, WebEx fatigue, whatever we'd like to call it here. And so uh, we're actually noodling this right now, a couple ideas, how we're going to extend Showpad in some ways, creative ways to really make the most of SKO. We've had a couple successes with customers so far. We're really looking to take it to the next level as we're starting to hit SKO season here in a couple months, but certainly everybody's planning right now. Uh, definitely reach out to me because uh, we'll have some pretty good ideas we want to share with some of our customers here in the coming weeks. That, that's great. That's great. So we talked about the gold medal success, the mountaintop rooftop. Let's talk about the time where we failed and we said, dang it, maybe not dang it, but we said a couple of different things that just kind of hit home and we kind of just took that moment and learned from that. So can you describe a moment where you actually bettered the relationship with enablement with our outside stakeholders too? Well, yeah, absolutely. You know, I'm, I'm usually at the bleeding edge of things. And, and oftentimes, you know, I, I don't realize that a lot of people, when you get comfortable, you get in your routine. It's not a bad thing. That's where you get success, you know, because you can do things very repetitively without even thinking about it. You're unconsciously competent. And I was pushing some things out at my last company, you know, both uh, with the platform we had with some messaging and content. And it's the mark with some of our best sales reps. And it wasn't because it was wrong or bad. It's just that they had their emotions that they were running with. And I was expecting them to make massive and significant change, which they weren't ready to, not that, not to that degree, because again, they're running really, really efficiently. So you got to be mindful of that. And I, I tried to push and change too hard. I had to let them change at their own pace and kind of show them the benefits. So it was a matter of more me explaining why the change, what we want to do and how this fits into their roadmap and their comfort zone of their pace of change. And granted, it took about a year for this top rep to change over and see how we were doing some things with representing research and talking about things and having, you know, a coupling of a talk track and slides and some follow-up things as a kit, a digital kit that we would share. But when he discovered it a year later, he pulled me aside at an event. He said, Russell, this is awesome. Why didn't you tell me about this before? It's like, man, I've been on your team calls for like the past year, every month. And I met you three times telling you about this, you know, it just seemed to fall on deaf ears. It's like, but yeah, you didn't explain what it meant for me. Mm -hmm. you, you explained what it meant for all those other people that aren't killing it, not making their number hitting 200% year over year. So I said, that's a great point. You know, he was only thinking about how do I continue to exceed my target hitting 200% when I'm solving for the 99 other people that are either just getting by or struggling to hit their target. Right. Yeah, no, that's, that's huge. 
it, it's crazy how much we try to give and yet we have to wait to <laughs> somebody else is on their own pace wanting to accept that at the same time oh yeah you know just think back to when the smartphones first came about and there's a lot of people that just didn't want to give up that blackberry <laughs> keyboard or you know even the old school flip phone you know because yeah. they were successful with that yeah yeah i uh, worked at telecom for good good chunk of time so yes i definitely understand yeah. that transition was, was tough uh so i'm sure you're you're in this boat as well too especially being in a new digital age a new covid age and having to pivot a little bit from your company now and it's something that i know a lot of people are struggling with with that correlation between product team marketing anybody else that has that go-to-market strategy and yet enablement not, might not be involved right at the right times how do you plan with your outside stakeholders for your releases to you know to the sales team or to the public working with your outside stakeholders on that point? You know, it's back to being that orchestrator. You know, I explained to them, look, we, we can't just expect to throw things over to sales via, you know, the chats, the emails, the text documents on cloud drives or even any of the platforms. So it's gotta be structured back to, you know, what does it mean for them? And I think it's best to define, you know, both your sales process and your sales methodology. What I mean is your sales process is just those steps and motions that sales takes for different stages of the deal leads into their forecasts. Sales methodology is just all about their tricks and tips of what they do, how they do discovery, how they set and ask questions, how they do uh, positioning and objection handling. And so coming back full circle when it comes to planning, you know, at any time that I'm working with a lot of different outside stakeholders, you know, marketing, campaigns, events, the product team, partners and services, I always try to have a visual and say, here's my world, the engine that's going on today. You're, you want to insert something in here to make it faster? Great, I understand. Let's find the best way how to do that because we need to have reasonable expectations that not everybody's going to stop in their day and pay attention for 30 minutes or an hour on something that they may only use once a year or twice a year. And so how do you fit all that stuff in? Our ecosystems are getting more and more complicated. So I think a lot of people are dealing with similar challenges, broader portfolio of things to sell, services to sell, partnerships to represent, and then all the stuff in the back office of how do I connect everything together? And so just having that visual picture of how you do it within your company as an enablement pro helps me communicate that to other departments and say, I want help me help you. Here's the engine. Let's figure out how we best fit in. Yeah. Yeah, that's huge. I think the collaboration is, is collaboration and communication is literally the key to every part of success that I found. And literally it's the one thing that keeps that bridge from every department, you know, standing strong. Yeah. Uh, so I love this question. It's always fun. It's always great. As an enablement person, we can always dream and we, that's like 90% of what we do every day. I feel like sometimes, uh, but if you had a magic wand, unlimited funds, whatever you could do, everything was going your way. What would be an ideal solution to make your relationship with outside stakeholders that much better? You know, and that's, that's a great question. Um, and I, I think it's, it's not too difficult but it's uh, to answer, but it's difficult to achieve. It's, it's that I want to make sure that we have some standard ways of working, you know, because people write emails in different ways. They construct the documents. We use Google Drives or, or uh, Google Docs or Office 365, but even just consistency in your memos, your slides, your internal versus external, how you do project planning, project management. That's the hardest part, you know, back to my Rosetta Stone, not only are we talking different languages, but we don't have digital transformation, we have digital explosion. You know, your marketing teams are using three to five cloud share applications, two or four different project management tools. Sales, they don't do project management, they do selling and forecasting. So how do you insert something to their motion? So trying to bring that stuff together, you know, if we could have central ways, commonality of using tools, that facilitates collaboration a lot better. I think people just presume if I put digital words on some type of digital thing, people will consume it and use it the right way. And oftentimes I'm like, okay, what are we doing here? You know, what's even something as simple as, you know, Matt sending out an email invite, what's in the agenda? Yeah. What, what's our goal of meeting today? But to all too often, it's like, oh, I got 30 minutes of somebody's time. I'm going to take it up. It's like, what do we want as an outcome of this? Just to catch up? That's fine. Do we need to make a decision, share information, provide an update, uh, escalate something? So just being able to have more consistency in how we use some of these digital tools, that's my magic wand. It's, it's getting there. It's just setting a standard and sharing it with others, adapting it to their needs. Yeah, I think uh, I could definitely speak to that, especially with Slack and email. Like you said, like, especially now that we're all digital, we don't have that human element. So we do find those 30 minute buckets and said, yep, that's mine. I'm going to take it with no rhyme or reason or what you want to do. Or even with Slack, you know, we have the integrations with Zoom. You just click the call and there you are. And so, yeah, people, I think it's just having that standard and that, that agenda basically ironed out with objectives is huge. Uh, <clears throat> what have you learned that you might share with other people, you know, as far as 
working with different stakeholders, what has been like the biggest thing that you can learn or that you've learned or that can provide guidance for others at this time? You know, something I've done, in, you know, because I'm lucky, so I'm fortunate there, that I was able to spend time in a, a proper sales role, a proper marketing role, a proper engineering role, and, and really understand and appreciate that. Back to talk in the same language. I didn't just pick up a book and try to read about marketing. I actually worked in marketing for quite some time. So I understand brands, impression, share of voice, you know, paper, click, things like that. Having that appreciation, you know, helps, you know, provide that empathy for other people and the challenges they have. It was all too easy for me when I was an engineer to think that, yeah, salespeople, they just go out to dinner, get people drunk, and the orders come. Or marketing, it's the party planning committee and the arts and crafts department. It wasn't until, you know, I had to do these things again that you really understand how hard they are and how you need to appreciate that and show that empathy and get people to work together. So that's the number one thing we don't have enough of right now. I think, you know, just in the current environment, you know, just show empathy for people. But by and large, people have good intentions trying to do the good thing and right thing and just show some empathy and that'll at least reduce tensions a bit. Yeah. Yeah, that's especially now in a digital age where you don't know what everybody else is dealing with at home too. And yeah, empathy goes a long way. That's for sure. <laughs> you might like this. We, we, act, we actually, uh, just to share on that front, just working together, like we actually had a, a, one of our um, employees, uh, employee resource groups get together just talking about being, being parents at home. It's just a tip that we're going to do that I, I encourage others is there, in Slack, there's actually a little zombie you can use for an icon. So we're going to start using that as a status if, you know, if you've got kids or you've got, you know, a, a sick mom you're taking care of or a sick dog, put yourself on zombie status where you're kind of working, but you're kind of a zombie at that, that day, <laughs> just because people can tell, you know, if you come into work, you know, and it's like, oh man, Russell, you look tired. It's like, yeah, you know, only got two hours of sleep last night. You can't tell if we're all digital. So we're using the zombie status that way. That, that way people know, okay, he's available, but he's kind of a zombie today, probably because of, you know, something he had to take care of, but he doesn't want to broadcast to everybody. So feel uh, free to step yeah, steal, steal that one if, if you need to. But uh, that, that was, again, we're, we're trying to bring some human element to the digital world that oftentimes it, it gets lost in the zeros and ones. Yeah, yeah. No, I, honestly, that might be the best tip that you've given today. <laughs> I love that. That is so great. I'm definitely going to start using it. Uh, <laughs> Russ, I can't thank you enough. This has been awesome. <laughs> Getting to know you on a, on a personal front as well as a business front has been fantastic as well, too. So, I, I again... You're awesome. I love this. If you guys have questions about what Showpad can do, right, reach out to Russell, especially with SKO coming up. Him and I have got great ideas. Showpad's got solutions. He can definitely help you out with some other fronts on that as well. So definitely get in touch with him, connect with him on LinkedIn. Russ, is there anything else that you want to leave us before we sign off for the day? Uh, no, I may be in Colorado, but I'm still Midwest at the Seoul. So, you know, Midwest fist bump there. And uh, yeah, this is what I do. That's why I joined Showpad is, is to help other people be successful in this role that doesn't have a lot of clarity, doesn't have a lot of support. We have a lot of accountability, not a lot of authority. So we just have to be very positive and clever on how we get stuff done. So I'm really excited to be part of the community. That's awesome. And we're, we're definitely excited to have you as well, too. So thanks again, Russ. Guys, you thank you again for another episode of Matt Chats. We'll, keep you, we'll catch you guys later. Thank you.